Good morning and welcome to Grace MB Church for August 2nd. We're just really pleased that you're able to join us online to share in a time of praise and worship of our God and also a time of study of His Word. Through the summer, we've been contemplating the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians, and we have talked about love, joy, peace, and patience. Now, the thing that we're going to focus on today is kindness. Kindness is really something that we're all aware of when we receive acts of kindness, when people show kindness to us, even in a kind word or a kind gesture. So I'm really thankful that Paul McLeod is still joining us again today to carry on with our uh, study. And I'm looking forward to hearing what Paul has to say about kindness. Throughout the scriptures, uh, kindness is often talked about in terms of God, God's kindness to us. And it's often connected to his love and his kindness that is demonstrated towards us. And so I wanted to read a passage of scripture from the book of Ephesians. Uh, I'm sorry, the book of Titus, chapter 3. And uh, Paul is writing and he says this, Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always to be gentle toward everyone. Really a nice way to live is what Paul is suggesting in relationship, not only with government and authorities, but with one another. Then he goes on and he says, At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. That's how we tend to live in our own human experience. It's not a very pretty sight, is it? But Paul goes on and he says, but, but when the kindness, when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, when the kindness of and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become his heirs, the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good, to doing what is kind. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his word today. Let's pray as we prepare our hearts to hear from God this morning. Father, we recognize that you're a God of love, a God of compassion, and in kindness, in a desire to demonstrate your love to us, in kindness, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior, to give us life, eternal life, and your Spirit lives in us to help us demonstrate your love to others, to reflect your kindness and how we relate to others and treat others. And so, Father, it is our prayer as we continue to contemplate the fruit of your Spirit, the fruit that you want to develop in our lives. And as we reflect on kindness today, Lord, might your Spirit develop that in us. Might you call us to acts of kindness, to acts of doing good to one another, to loving one another. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. 
God bless you as you continue to worship the Lord today and contemplate the gift of his kindness to you today. Amen. When we read Paul writing to Titus, he emphasized the kindness of God that was demonstrated to us with the sending of his son, Jesus. Kindness is part of God's character, but it also is a gift of the Spirit, a fruit of the Spirit, and, and God working in us should help us to grow and develop an attitude and a lifestyle of kindness. And I guess we shouldn't be surprised that when we look at David, the man after God's own heart, that there's stories that are reflected in his life of demonstrating kindness. And Paul is going to speak to us this morning about that. And so I'd like to read one particular story about David and his kindness. And it's taken in 2 Samuel chapter 9. And this is the story. Then David said, Is there yet anyone left in the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and they called him to David. And the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, Is there not yet anyone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba, Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is crippled in both feet. So the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Behold, he's in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel in Lobadar. Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, the son of Amiel from Lobadar. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and prostrated himself. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he said, Here is your servant. And David said to him, Do not fear, for I will surely show kindness to you for the sake of your father Jonathan, and will restore to you all the land of your grandfather Saul, and you shall eat at my table regularly. Again he prostrated himself and said, What is your servant that you should regard a dead dog like me? Then the king called Saul's servant Ziba and said to him, All that belonged to Saul and to all his house I have given to your master's grandson. And you and your sons and your servants shall cultivate the land for him, and you shall bring in the produce so that the, your master's grandson may have food. Nevertheless, Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall eat at my table regularly. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. And then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my king the Lord commands, his servant to so your servant will do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table as one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who lived in the house of Ziba were servants to Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate at the king's table regularly. Now he was lame in both feet. We just pray God's blessing on Paul as he shares from this passage of Scripture what God has laid on his heart for us today. God bless you all. Well, good morning to you, Grace Church. It is a privilege to be back with you again and sharing. You know, this series on the fruit of the Spirit has been incredibly relevant and, and uh, I'd say timely in my life this summer. The first week I shared with you was on joy. And uh, it was uh, just after that I had a back injury and it was uh, a couple of tough days. And then uh, I shared on patience and Shortly after that, we bought a new puppy, and I've been learning, and God's been teaching me a lot about patience there. Today, we come to the theme of kindness, and I want to ask you this question. Do you consider yourself to be a kind person? 
Think about that for a moment. Are you kind? Are you friendly? Are you generous? Patient and easygoing? Warm-hearted? Thoughtful? Are you just fun to be with? Now, I know right now some of you may be thinking, uh, no, I'm not, but I'd sure like to meet somebody like that. But think about this. A kind person is someone who stands out in a crowd, right? They might may not be the one who talks the most, but there's something about a kind person. It's sort of a built-in attraction. It's just there. And when a person is kind, uh, it not only shows in their face, but it also shows up in their actions, right? When I think of the characteristics of kindness, it's very evident that this is a fruit of the Spirit in our lives. And as followers and disciples of Jesus, every child of God is to be marked by this quality. Because we have the indwelling person of the Holy Spirit who is the source of that kind of kindness. So the natural outflow in our lives to those around us should be one of kindness. And of all these other character characteristics that we've been looking at, uh, joy and peace and patience. And we have to ask the question is, is that true of me? I mean, do your children see you as being kind? Does your spouse, your co-workers, your neighbors? You know, for me, uh, it's there sometimes, but there's lots of room for growth. And I will be the first to admit that I need a deeper filling of the Holy Spirit in my life so that, that this fruit becomes increasingly more evident in my life. You know, when we uh, think about kindness, uh, when we think about that world, like when most of us think about the word kindness, we think about someone who's nice. When we think of someone who's pleasant, someone who's all smiles and they laugh even at your bad jokes and they don't really cause any problems. But when we think of this virtue uh, in terms of biblical or Christian kindness, there's got to be more to the story, right? There has to be something that's deeper and different when it comes to kindness. I mean, when Paul was pressed Think about this, to give a list of the virtues that would be proof of our discipleship. He named kindness. And not just in listing the fruit of the Spirit, he listed it in several different occasions. Look at a couple of verses with me. Ephesians 4, verse 32. Paul writes, he says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ... God forgave you. Colossians 3.12, he writes, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. He's saying, put that clothing on, kindness. So that's what people see. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 6, he writes, rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance, in troubles, hardships, and calamities, in beatings, imprisonments, and riots, in labor, sleepless nights, and hunger. And then look at this, in purity, knowledge, patience, and what? Kindness in the Holy Spirit and in sincere love. Paul also tells us that God's kindness towards us in Romans 2 leads us to repentance. That's powerful. His kindness leads us to repentance. He writes, Do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? That is some pretty heavy-duty kindness, isn't it? 
that's not just kind of small talk in the church foyer or in the atrium before or after the service kindness. That's like Olympic strength kindness. That's powerful. So what I'd like to do today is explore together uh, some of the, like the striking difference between just general worldly kindness and biblical Olympic strength fruit of the spirit kindness. And to do that, I'd like to look at kindness demonstrated and lived out in someone's life. And it's illustrated in the life of David. And it's from the text that uh, Harry read for us earlier this morning. 2 Samuel chapter 9. And we'll just jump right back into the story because it's been read for us. Think about this. Out of all the things David could ask in his life at this point in time, think about this. He asks this question. Is there anyone out of Saul's family, out of all the families, think about it, that David thinks about, the guy who was trying to kill David, hunting him down and trying to kill him, that guy? Is there anyone from Saul's family, David asks, that I can show kindness to and be a blessing to? That's amazing. I just want to let that sit for a moment. What does that mean to you and to me today? Is there anyone? David asks the question, is there anyone still alive from Saul's family? If so, I want to show God's kindness to them. I want you to imagine being David. I want you to imagine uh, waking up one day and just realizing how much God has done for you. I mean, you started as a shepherd. You're taking care of your father's sheep. And in a household where you were ostracized and ignored and even overlooked. And you wake up one morning and you're in a palace. You're not playing the harp. You're not attending to the king's needs. He's reflected and David has thought to himself and what? He's going, I'm the king. What kind of life am I living? And you see, when you've gone through things in your life and you've got a good memory, then it doesn't take you long to be thankful for where God has brought you. No one has to convince you to give God praise and give God thanks. God has been so good to me. David is reflecting on the fact that there's no way in my own power that I could have brought myself into this point or to this point in my life. There was nothing about my life that was projected to be the king of Israel. And he wakes up one day like that. And after getting covenant keeping promises from God, like your seed will sit on the throne forever. David gets up one morning, and because he has a thankful heart, he says, I made a promise to Jonathan that I would always be in a covenant in covenant with him and anybody in his family. And he asks this question, is there anybody still alive from Saul's family that I can show kindness to? This is strong because he could have woken up, when you think about it, he could have woken up and said, man, I mean, let's find out if there's anyone, anyone from Saul's family still alive, and let's kill him. Because I don't want them to hear a story or tell a story, I and mean, they'll get mad, and they'll see what's happened, and they'll come after me. And he doesn't even say that it was his kindness. He just said, he wants to show God's kindness to them. The word for God's kindness in Scripture is uh, the word hesed. And this word is most often used by God speaking and demonstrating what he wants to do to his people. But David uses this word in the same way God uses this word. And the definition of this word hesed is faithful love, unfailing kindness, mercy, loyalty, faithfulness, 
goodness, graciousness. It's godly action. David wakes up one day and he says, you know, I need to show said to someone. I need to show someone unsolicited, unprovoked, loving kindness and mercy to somebody from Saul's family. So he gets this guy yeah, named Ziba, who used to be Saul's servant, and he says, is there anybody in Saul's family that is still alive that I can show kindness to? And he says, yes. Ziba says, uh, there's someone. Jonathan had a son named Mephi <laughs> Gotta say this, Mephibosheth. He's crippled. And David says, go get him. David says, go get him. He doesn't say, like, what's his background? So he gets this guy, Ziba, who used to be Saul's servant, and he asks, is there anybody in Saul's family that's still alive that I can show kindness to? And Ziba says, yes, there is someone. Jonathan had a son named Mephibosheth, and he's crippled. And David says, go get him. David says, go get him. He doesn't say, like, well, what? tell me about him. What's his background? Is he a warrior like Jonathan? He doesn't ask for a resume or any questions. He just asks if someone's alive, and he says, go get him. Could you imagine Mephibosheth on the other side of this? He's lived his whole life. He understands the line that he came from. And that if everything had gone right with Saul, then everything should have gone right with Jonathan. And Jonathan would have been king at some point in time, which means that he should have been king at some point in his life. He's now lived his entire life understanding that he had the opportunity to become king, but something happened outside of his control. And he finds himself in a situation like this. Can you imagine getting a call from David, being him, on that day and hearing that David wants to see him? Mephibosheth, I just heard from the king, Ziba says. King David, he wants to see you in his palace. Mephibosheth says, like, I mean, did he sound mad? I don't know. He said he just wants to see you, so come to the palace because I don't know. Like, I don't know why, but just, just get dressed and come. Well, Mephib he's thinking, like, what was his tone of voice? Because, like, I'm Mephib Mephibosheth, and I'm thinking he's, he's going to kill me. Did you tell him that I was related to Saul? Did you have, like, how did the conversation start? Did he... Did he bring this up? Like, who talked first? My name's got a lot of syllables in it. So, like, how did the name Mephibosheth come out of your mouth? So he comes to the house. He has no idea what mood David is in. He just knows that he can't go against the order of the king. So he shows up, and he's very humble. And when he walks in, David says, Mephibosheth! It's like he hasn't seen him in like years. And it's like, Phoebe, what's up? It's so good to see you. And Mephibosheth just says, like, I'm your servant. And David says, don't be afraid. Like, have a seat. I want to bless you. I want you to sit at my table from now on. I didn't bring you over here just to visit. I brought you over here to live. Oh, you, you know, like your father was Jonathan. He and I were like this, and your grandfather, he was Saul. I mean, me and Saul, we have a past, but like it's in the past. And your grandfather, Saul, like he owned all this land over here, so I'm going to give it to you. And every day, you're going to come and eat with me from now on. Mephibosheth is thinking about this conversation. He's asking himself, I mean, how can someone like me hang out with someone like you. I'm a dead dog. And here's the thing, he couldn't even see himself the way the king saw him. Even though he got invited to the palace and he got to sit at the table, what was running through his mind is a dead dog like me that doesn't deserve to sit and eat at a table like this. 
And David just keeps going right on. He's, he's saying, like, live it up, bring some wine, let's feast. That's, that's the land your father, your grandfather owned, and that's your your land. No jokes, I'm not gonna take it back from you. It's all yours now, it's yours. And David begins to express has said kindness in a way that blesses Mephibosheth's life. Let me just share with you briefly a few attributes of kindness from this story. Number one is kindness doesn't discriminate. I love how David asks the question, is anyone, anyone in Saul's family still alive? Anyone, doesn't have to be a warrior, not any people that fight like me, not anybody who has a, a royal bloodline and next in line. He just asks, is there anyone in Saul's family? Is there anyone in Saul's family still alive? Anyone to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? If so, I wanna show God's kindness to them. Wow. Zeba replied, you know, one of Jonathan's sons is still alive, but he's crippled in both feet. But kindness doesn't discriminate. You know, this is actually a lot about forgiveness. This is about what happens to you when you grow to the point that you can stop punishing people for the mistakes of the past and you tell people that don't even deserve to sit with you to, hey, come on, pull up a chair. Come sit down. Let's be reconciled. David doesn't discriminate. He just says, whoever is from the family, I don't care if they're crippled. I don't care if they're lame. I don't care if they're blind. I don't care what they're into. They could have been a thief. They could have been a murderer. Whoever they are, just bring them. Bring them to the table. Do you see how this is just like God? God's love, hold your breath. God's love is promiscuous. His grace is promiscuous because it will get with anyone. Whoever you are, whatever you've been into, God just says, I'll take you just got out of the drug house, I'll take you. You're addicted to porn, I'll take you. You've been a liar, I'll take you. You've been an adulterer, I'll take you. You've been a cheater, you're bitter, you're unforgiving, living with an angry spirit. Whatever you've been into, wherever you are at, I will take whoever you are. That's God's kindness. And that's the kindness that David displays, kindness does not discriminate. Second thing I see is kindness doesn't intimidate. Second Samuel 9, 7, David says, uh, don't be afraid. I love how David says, just he says like, don't be afraid to sit at this table. I know you're probably intimidated right now and you're afraid but I want to take all that intimidation and fear away don't be afraid I know who you are I know where you are I know where you've come from and I intend to show kindness to you because of my promise to your father Jonathan have you ever been promised something anybody ever and that person who kind of promised you something and then they break their promise. So you know what you know what that feels like. You know, I promise to have this back to you by next Friday. Been there before? Or I promise like this won't change our relationship. Ouch. I promise you whatever. 
Ever had a promise broken? David says, don't be intimidated and don't be afraid. He says to Mephibosheth, why? Because I made a promise to your dad. He's not even around anymore. And I'm still not going to break it. He wouldn't even know if I followed up on this promise or not. But I am a man of my word. And again, isn't David acting just like God right here? He's saying, I'm going to fulfill this promise. I will give you all the property. I mean, this is amazing that once belonged to your grandfather Saul. And you will eat here with me at the king's table every single day. Kindness doesn't intimidate. Kindness uh, doesn't manipulate. I love that David never says, you know, you're here, but just remember this though. Hey, remember that I did this. Okay? Don't forget it. You know, like, you owe me a favor, like later. Because like, where were you? You were a dead dog. You would never have been at this table. So just don't forget who brought you here. That's manipulation, right? That's control. And David says, I don't want you to be intimidated. Don't be afraid. Relax. I'm not setting you up. Relax. I'm not about to have a conversation about your grandfather. I'm not bringing up the past. Relax. I just want to sit at this table with you. I want to show kindness to you. Not one time, and then you go back to where you came from. I just want to establish a new normal in your life by the way we start relating today. It's a beautiful picture. Lastly, kindness doesn't segregate. You know, one of the things that repeats over and over through this chapter are the words uh, Mephibosheth, who was crippled in both feet. Over and over throughout the chapter, the last verse of the chapter, you read it, and crippled. Just crippled. He lived in Jerusalem and ate regularly at the king's table and still crippled. Died crippled. Crippled. He was at the table crippled. He ate food every day. Crippled. God restored all of his grandfather's land to him, crippled. And he never got healed from being crippled. He never took another normal step in his life. His babysitter, you know, the story tells us that dropped him uh, when he was about four or five years old and crippled him. And he was never the same. And he was still at the table. He never had to get better before he sat down. And he didn't even have to get better once he sat down. And you know something that is really beautiful is that when you're sitting down at the table, you wouldn't even have noticed that he was crippled. The truth is, you and I, we all look equal at the table. It's only that when we get up and leave the table that we are reminded of how broken we really are. Now, at this point, if you haven't figured out that you, in fact, are Mephibosheth, that I am Mephibosheth, you're a little slow. Every single one of us has a Mephibosheth story. Every single one of us is broken in some way. And I don't know if you think you're broken, but if you don't think you're broken, that's exactly where you're broken. What David is doing in this moment is such a, a type and shadow and, and a picture of what Jesus has done for us. Look at these words Paul writes about kindness in Ephesians 2 verse 4. 
He says, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, has said, is the word, kindness, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our trespasses. It is by grace you have been saved. Look at this. And God raised us up with Christ and what? And he seated us. He seated us with him. God in his kindness does not discriminate. He doesn't intimidate. He doesn't manipulate. He doesn't segregate. And he has said to you and to me, he says, pull up a chair. I know your life story. Sit down. And God has done this so that he can point to us in all the future ages as examples of his incredible wealth, of his grace and of his kindness, his love and kindness towards us. That, my friends, is a picture of kindness in David's life. It's just like God's kindness towards you and me. And that's the fruit that he longs to see in the lives of his children. To anyone and everyone. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Jesus and Holy Spirit, we ask that you would help us abide in you so the fruit of your character would be formed in our lives increasingly for your glory and your pleasure. Amen.